I thank God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. From Philippians. Forty years ago, 41 years ago, I attended my first synod in the Diocese of Toronto as a young deacon. I'm trying to remember how many synods I've been to. Uh, I can't remember, but it's at least 75 to 80. <laughs> I've only missed one synod in the Diocese of Toronto, and that's because I was on sabbatical one year. But naturally, as a young cleric, 41 years ago, you know everything. And you have an opinion, of course, the correct opinion, about every subject. So another newly minted deacon, a certain Philip Poole, <laughs> and I decided that a motion on the floor of Synod to amend the canon about candidates for ordination had not taken into account our perspective <laughs> as new ordinands. And so we brashly moved an amendment. Uh, anyway, who, who were these people who had moved and seconded the original motion? I had no idea who Archdeacon Arthur Brown <laughs> or Canon Duncan Abraham were. <clears throat> well, our amendment was soundly defeated. And Philip and I were invited to the office of one Canon Douglas Blackwell executive assistant to, Archbishop, uh, to Bishop Garnsworthy for a wee chat. <laughs> and it turned out to be a life-changing experience. <laughs> because Douglas became a mentor and a friend, and as did a subsequent executive assistant to the bishop, Michael Bedford-Jones, and almost 15 years later, I succeeded both of them as the executive assistant to the bishop. I have been in the bishop's office, therefore, since 1992. This marks my last synod as your bishop, and I want to thank you for the privilege and honor it has been to serve this remarkable diocese. Now in my 42nd year of ordination, my 16th year in Episcopal ministry, and my 15th year as your diocesan. Tonight I'm not going to give a charge to Synod. That will be up to Bishop Andrew to set the direction. Rather, I will give you a few, hopefully brief, reflections on some of the significant changes that are the foundations in which we will continue to build. From Lewis Garnsworthy and Alan Reed until Andrew Asbel, I have worked under the leadership or beside 22 bishops in this diocese, 17 since I joined the Synod office as executive assistant to Terry Finlay in 1992. Each was different, each brought specific gifts, each served with great faithfulness, and each provided the church with the needed gifts at the time. I'm just going to touch on a few of the more significant changes I've seen in some of that period of ministry. The increased place of laity, rooted in a renewed understanding of baptism that began in the 1970s, or took form in the 1970s, and then more especially the place of women in the official leadership of the church. I was ordained deacon on the very same day that Marge Pizak was ordained as the first female priest in the Diocese of Toronto. It was 25 years ago, I was executive assistant in, to the bishop, that Victoria Matthews was elected as the first woman to be a bishop in the Canadian church on the same day that Michael Bedford-Jones was first elected. So they are celebrating their jubilees this year. That needs an applause.
has led to the development of a core of highly trained, highly skilled laity to work across the diocese in congregational development, stewardship coaching, facilitation and training. Building on the Curcio movement of the 70s and then the Logos programming of the 80s and now part of our diocesan ministry strategy. The Order of the Diocese of Toronto has been established to honor the significant contributions of exemplary lay people doing their ordinary ministries within their communities. Over 250 have been awarded this distinction so far. That sounds like a lot until you realize that it's half of 1% of the people of this diocese. The Our Faith, Our Hope, Reimagining Church campaign raised $40 million, increasing our capacity to support ministry in parishes, in the diocese, and across our country. The Ministry Allocation Fund provides a transparent policy for making grants that has funded new church development, innovative forms of ministry, and parish support. The establishment of faith works has meant that as Anglicans in this diocese, we have a focus program that has contributed over $24 million to assist tens of thousands of vulnerable people in our society. Our social justice and advocacy has given voice to the need to change laws and policies and, and provide opportunities for the poor and the marginalized in our wider society that reflect Jesus' call to serve the least. The development and implementation of a robust sexual misconduct policy and screening in faith have enabled us to respond clearly, effectively, and proactively to abuse and for the protection of children and vulnerable adults in our church. Our policies have informed those of other jurisdictions right across North America. The rehabilitation of ministry of healing and the training of lay anointers has allowed us, th this ministry, to become a regular part of liturgical and, and pastoral care in most parishes, unimagined 30 years ago. The restoration of the diaconate as a distinct and essential ministry in its own right, and not merely as a transitional way station on the road to the real ministry of priesthood. When I arrived at the Synod office in, 2000, in 1992, there were computers, <laughs> and typewriters, and dictaphones, and one answering machine, and yes, some quill pens. The invention of the internet, electronic communication, and social media have revolutionized and will continue to change incredibly how we communicate, relate to one another, gather information, create communities, and make decisions. It's changing how we do church and has the possibility of creating the conditions that will be as disruptive and creative as the printing press and the Reformation were 500 years ago. Greater access, however, to information has not led to better understanding of truth. We are the best educated and most informed society that has ever existed, and yet never before has public discourse been so fact-free and truth alternative. That used to be called lying. <laughs> Our diocese has a continuing obligation and opportunity to speak truth to power. We're in the midst of rapid demographic and cultural transformation. Some stats. I'm a stats geek. Did you know that up until 1980, up until 1980, there were a total of about one half million immigrants in the greater Toronto area, which includes about two thirds of the Diocese of Toronto. Half million immigrants up until 1980. Of that half million, more than 50% were European. 
In the last five years alone, there are over 360,000 immigrants to the GTA, almost 260,000 from Asia. We are now home to about a quarter of a million people from the Caribbean in total. In the last five years alone, that same number of people, a quarter of a million, have arrived in Toronto from just five countries. India, China, Philippines, Iran, and Pakistan. I bet you didn't consider Iran in that list. Today we have Anglican services in Toronto, Anglican services in Toronto, in English, Cantonese, Mandarin, Japanese, Tamil, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, Bengali, Malayalam, uh, Tagalog, Urdu, Swahili, and Sudanese languages, Ghanaian languages, Cree and Oji Cree, and others that I have missed. And that's just languages. That does not mention our accommodation of differing cultural or spiritual or theological differences. We are a microcosm of the Anglican communion in this diocese that is unique in any part of the world. And it presents both incredible opportunities and special challenges of diversity and inclusion in a way that would have been unfathomable to Bishop John Strawn, our first bishop, or even to Bishop George Snell, or even to Lewis Garnsworthy. <laughs> Globalization is not simply a virtual reality in a networked world Globalization is our daily, physical, and practical lived experience. And in this globalized world, the, cap the capacity of our diocese to engage internationally is unique in Canada. And in fact, probably unique in the world. Our work bringing together the Anglican bishops in dialogue participating in funding the Indaba processes that have created opportunities for deep listening and growing understanding across the whole communion. The number of Toronto Anglicans who serve on international commissions and bodies in the communion are unmatched by any diocese in the world. In a world that seems to be increasingly polarized, we have striven in this diocese and largely succeeded in holding not only the center, but even some of the fraying edges by creating a big tent where many can find a secure place where differences can be argued and expressed and lived out without breaking the relationships. Contrary, we have a number of challenges, and these two are not new. We have fewer parishes, fewer parishioners, fewer clergy than we had a decade ago, or two decades ago, or four decades ago. Contrary to popular rhetoric, it's not a recent phenomenon. It began in the 50s. In fact, the longest serving Bishop of Toronto fretted about declining numbers in his address to Synod in 1901. Twenty-five percent of our parishes are actually growing. The others are static or declining. That is actually better than most institutions today, but we should not let that comfort us too much. We have much to learn and we need each other. All of us need all of us, to faithfully discern where God is calling us to be and to do. For me, the most fundamental change in the past 15 years has been the focus on missional work. Not mission over the sea and far away, but over mission here, at home, in our neighborhood, on our street. In spite of the differences that might separate us at some levels, especially in matters of sexuality and marriage, we have found common ground in the call to be missional. Not as a program, 
not to put bums in pews, not to maintain our own historic roles and privileges, but missional as a way of life, a way of understanding and of participating in God's purposes for God's world, turning outward toward the world for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the world, for the sake of the kingdom of God. This has been driving our strategy, our decisions, our investment of resources, our prayer. Even if we're not doing it perfectly, it is the direction we are turned. Our commitment to Jesus Christ and his way, his truth, and his life is what binds us together in a way that is hopeful and compelling and joyful, and there is so much encouragement in this. This is our mission, this is our vision. We are a church that proclaims and embodies Jesus Christ through compassionate service, intelligent faith, and godly worship. We work to build healthy, missional Anglican communion, communities to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's been my incredible joy to have been part of this journey with you. There are so many people that I could thank. It would take me the next day or two to even begin to do that. So instead of risking forgetting someone, I just want to mention five people. And let them be signs of a whole lot of other things. The first is my wife of 42 years, Ellen. You can clap. It would not have been possible without my arch support. And my arch critic. And my bubble pricker and the one who keep blowing up the bubble to make it fresh and whole again. Mary Conliffe, who for 17 years has been uh, one of my closest confidants. And my chancellor, Claire Burns, who was number one on my speed dial. Well, actually, number two. Ellen's one. <laughs> and then two people who, in the uh, terms of the Salvation Army, have been promoted to glory, Bob Falby and Terry Finlay. And there's one more, you, you, each one of you. You have made a difference. You continue to make a difference. You will make a difference. I leave with confidence and hope. I've never been one to look back and hanker for the good old days. I'd rather, I see rather those good old days as signs of, the, of God's abiding faithfulness and look forward to the next thing that God wants me and us to do. In the words of St. Paul from a different letter. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in, strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. 
And now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now over to you, Bishop Andrew. <laughs> Do you remember the first time you learned how to ride a bicycle? If your experience was anything like mine, it happens actually in stages. I first learned in the 1960s when banana seats and big handlebars and streamers were all the rage. That was not my bike. I had a hand-me-down from my older brother. It was red with chip paint and a white seat and bent fenders. It was so uncool. And what made it even more uncool was it had training wheels on it. Now, there are some things that are good about training wheels because they can give you confidence when you don't quite have your balance. And they can help you ride and keep upright when you're kind of tipping over. And you can navigate tight corners. But with time, you realize that there are limitations when you have training wheels on. While you can outspeed the little kids on the tricycle, you can't quite keep up with the big kids. And then comes that fateful day when the training wheels actually come off. And I remember that day like it was yesterday, my father holding me up and I leaning into him, hoping that he wouldn't let me go. And then as I'm trying to curb my fear, he's encouraged me, me with words like, don't look down, look up, watch where you're going, keep pedaling. Now pedal faster. Don't look down, look up, keep moving. And we just kept moving with speed and more speed. And before I knew it, there was a little nudge. And I thought he was still there. And it's only when I actually looked back and noticed him far behind, that's when I wiped out. <laughs> but you know what? It didn't matter because I'd, I'd caught for that little moment that I'd taken flight. Just for a moment. It feels like I have training wheels on again as I've been learning how to ride and pedal alongside this diocese of 183 parishes and 230 congregations that stretch over a huge, massive area that are diverse in their liturgical and theological expression from low to high and everything in between. From the small town and the crossroads to the inner city to the suburbs, and as we've been hearing at the Synod, speaking languages that we have not heard before in our presence in our communities, as we are now new voices and new tones and new languages sung and prayed. On my first Sunday, it was Spanish, and on my second Sunday, it was Cantonese. What a delight. And in each congregation, devoted and dedicated lay leaders like yourselves who every day live out your baptismal call. And clergy who are so gifted in these changing times to take new risks for the sake of ministry. And at the core, a college of bishops, namely Peter and Priscilla, Kevin and Jenny, 
who are so wise and so dedicated and so passionate for the gospel, not just in their geographical areas, but for the whole diocese and for the whole church. And then you step into 135 Adelaide Street and you appreciate all of the gears and the pedals and the spokes and the tires and the wheels and how it all goes together from department to department as very dedicated staff do this. This is remarkable. I've been to a lot of different synods that are not run like this. But for the last month and just a bit, I have been watching and learning from Colin Johnson on how to ride the bike. Now the first thing that you learn is that actually Colin never puts his hands on the handlebars. <laughs> that actually what he's doing is he's juggling with one hand all of the issues and the canons and the finances and the HR issues. On the other hand, he's drinking a latte with a speed <laughs> dial to the chancellor. He is reciting from memory every collect that has ever been written and can tell you the liturgical origin of it. He does not need a GPS to get anywhere in this diocese. He knows where every parish is. And if you press him, he can name the succession of incumbents down to the beginning of the last century. It's like a kid with a hockey card. And meanwhile, yours truly is going <laughs> It's not just the past and it's not just the future. We are in a moment in between. We are in a moment between what was and what is coming. And when you live in a transition moment, it is really important for all of us just simply to be perfectly still. And the first emotion that comes to bear is gratitude. Gratitude that God has called us and brought us safely to this moment, all of us. And deep gratitude to you, Colin. You have paddled so hard. And when we were tempted to look down you said, look up, watch where you're going. Keep your eye on what is most important. Chase after a savior that is calling us to life. I always use this day of synod as kind of that one moment, if we just get to synod, I'll be okay. And then if I just get to the next thing, I'll be okay. And as we get closer and closer to December the 31st, it feels like the pace is actually quickening. And before long, we're going to be running, you next to the bike and us on it. And before you know it, Colin is just going to give a little nudge. And when we look back, we will see him. And then there will be times when we will have little wipeouts. <laughs> but it's okay because we know how to get back up. It's important to look back. And it's important to look into the future. But we can't look too far into the future, not yet, because we're in between. But I'd like to share just four things with you tonight about what I'm hearing and listening and watching in the last month and a bit. The first is this, to see Jesus. When you step into the pulpit at St. James Cathedral, you will see a plaque that says, we wish to see Jesus. It comes from John chapter 12. It's when the Greeks come and, and they say to Philip and to Andrew, we wish to see Jesus. It's a reminder to the preacher that it is a privilege and a joy to open the word. And it is a tremendous responsibility to open the word in changing times and dynamic ways to, to somehow touch the hurt and the sorrow and the bereft nature that comes out of the pews Sunday by Sunday. That we might crowd around with Christ together and experience the risen Lord in our midst. My mind just keeps going back to the reading that we heard at the Eucharist this morning. It just keeps filtering down for me. It has all day. Imagine that moment when Jesus goes back to Capernaum. He goes back home. We don't know if it's his house or Peter's house. 
and a great crowd gathers inside and outside and they are crowding around the front door and they're craning their necks and they're cupping their ears in the hopes that they might just be able to hear a word that they need to hear. Sometimes we don't even know why we're hungry. Sometimes we don't even know what's missing. But when we hear it, we know we've been fed. Just like the Greeks who wished to see Jesus so long ago, I want to see and experience the real thing. That same hunger is with us in our day today. Some of us have wandered away from our faith and we've been away so long we do not know how to get home. And some of us have never had the opportunity of learning and hearing the story of who Jesus is. When our children were young, I had to figure out a way to teach them how to pray. And so you always start with your eldest. I always feel sorry for the eldest in every family. <laughs> and I remember when Hannah was about three years old, and I tried to imagine how I was going to teach this young child. And as usual, in the evening, laying down, reading a, a story or after the story, one night I said to Hannah, how would you like to pray? And she said, Daddy, I don't know how you, you start. So I said, Dear God, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the clouds and the sun. And she elbowed me. And she said, And the trees and the birds. <laughs> and the trees and the birds. And we pray for all the people who are poor and don't have any food and those who are sick. Don't forget Nana and Grandpa. Nana and Grandpa. And all the way through that prayer, we went back and forth. The second night, the same. The third night, the same again. And on the fourth night, I said, Hannah, how would you like to start? And it was like watching a kid ride a bike. It is the same in our call as parishes, to be intentional about forming and reforming and telling and gathering around the word and gathering around liturgy and creating liturgies that inspire and speak to a changing time, a plumbing the depths of our traditions so that we unearth all of the gems of old colics that still speak and sing in an age that longs to hear and to see Jesus in the way we want to too. The second, we need each other. Imagine the paralyzed man on a pallet with four friends as they're wending their way through the streets of Capernaum and they come to the house and there's a huge crowd and the four friends know that no amount of elbowing is ever going to get them close. Try and imagine if in your own mind that process where they decided that it might be a good idea to scale the house, to clamber up the side, to lift the tiles and dig through the roof. I wonder whose idea that was. I wonder if the paralyzed man said to his friends, really, no, actually, I don't want you to go to that kind of effort. Maybe we should just go home. And then lifting him up the side of the house and saying, no, really, honestly, I think we should just go home. <laughs> and did he stop protesting when they started lifting the tiles and digging through for him? Did he go silent? Imagine the dusk coming down and daylight bleeding into the living room. Imagine how conspicuous he might have felt as he's being lowered down. And how so many had looked down on him for so long and how he had looked down on himself. And the text says, and Jesus saw their faith and said, son, your sins are forgiven. It was their tenacity, their faith, their trust, their hunger to push through so that their friend might be healed that made all the difference in the world. It takes that kind of tenacity to be the church today. To scale the impossible and to break through in places where we ought not to go sometimes. It is important for us to take the risks that we didn't think we were capable of doing. Sometimes it's the church that's paralyzed. 
Sometimes the church is afraid of what's coming around the corner. Sometimes it's the sins of our past that paralyze us. We are learning that as we walk with our indigenous brothers and sisters. Some of us feel quite paralyzed in facing general sin in 2019 because we're afraid. But this I know. We need each other. We need all of us to lift the church. We need conservative and liberal, charismatic and high church. We need LGBTQ straight. We need all of us to be able to face the future because it is Jesus that transforms us. And it is Jesus who will say, pick up your mat and walk. It is important for us to be able to walk in unison together and while we are afraid to walk anyway. My pledge is that we walk together. It is not enough just to tolerate each other. Jesus did not say, tolerate your neighbor as you tolerate yourself. <laughs> Jesus did not say, make room for your neighbor as you make room for yourself. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. We are in this together, folks. Number three, creation matters. When it was Sophie, our youngest's turn to learn how to pray, she would keep coming back to the same petition over and over and over every single night. She would simply say, dear God, let there be enough water. I had never at her age ever imagined saying such a petition, never had to worry about it. And now we do. With the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from the UN, we have sobering news. And while we might be able to argue the semantics of it all, in the same way that we argue the semantics of the prophets of old, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Amos and Hosea, we would throw it all out at our peril because the truth is being told to us and we are being confronted by it. Perhaps that's why so many of our young are feeling anxious. The church needs not to be passive now but active, because creation matters. It matters for this generation and our grandchildren's generation and our great-grandchildren's generation. And we need to learn how to walk together as a people of faith because we are created in God's image. The fourth thing, there's a hole in my roof I've often imagined that moment at the end of that reading when the crowd goes home <laughs> and Peter's wife looks up and says, there's a hole in my roof. And for some churches, that is a reality. And for some churches, it's a reality that is a game changer in saying we can't fix that hole in the roof. For some of us, we are burdened by our old structures and we pour all of our energy into old buildings. But a hole in your roof gives you a new advantage and a new vantage point in seeing creation and the future in a new way. And it will take all of the innovation and the creativity of all of us to imagine new structures and how we use our properties and our buildings in creating new partnerships with community members in our large towns and big towns and small towns. And there are holes in our structures too, as we heard from our intercultural working group. And structures that divide and keep out, that we need to have the courage to change and transform. And how we make decisions so that we do that with clarity, always keeping our eyes on the faith that has called us and the faith that is in us. 
I'm a bit nervous to take the training wheels off, but I am so excited. And I am so excited by what I have heard at this synod, by the missional moments, the creativity of, these, of all the congregations across this diocese, and even in parishes where there is deep hurt and malaise, a new sense of a dawning day, of new creative ways that we will meet the future. Don't be afraid. Pedal along. Thanks be to God. We're in good hands. Amen.